Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Let's see if I can get through what I've... <laughs> oh, hallelujah. The Lord delights in our prosperity. He delights in the prosperity of his people. Amen? So um, let's see. I'm going to talk about um, the pr so a few prosperity principles or scriptures um, because really it's kind of the opposite of how the world does it, right? The world is save, save. Not that it's bad to save, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but, you know, it's give. Give, 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 and it shall be given unto you. So Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it, Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. So our tithe is a 10%, and that it's not, it's not a question. We don't be like, okay, Lord, um, should I tithe this week, or should I tithe because of what my bank account says? No. It is, we tithe no matter what. That's 10%. And if you don't know what 10% is, take out your phone calculator, and whatever you have, multiply it times 0.1. <laughs> okay. And that is your tithe. That is your 10%. Without a doubt, that is what we do. If you're a child of God and if you're under the sound of my voice, you tithe. You just make a decision to do it. And if you haven't been doing it, then repent. Repent today. Change your way of thinking. Don't look at what your bank account says because we live by faith. Amen. Not by what we see in our bank. Okay, we live on the principles of God's word, so repent and start tithing today. Trust me, you cannot afford to not tithe, okay? There is much work to be done for the kingdom of God, and it takes finances, okay? There is much work for us, for this body to do, amen? You can't afford not to tithe. <sighs> Okay, so what kind of mentality do you have? Do you have a, a kingdom mentality or a poverty mentality? Okay, so we hear the word of God, right? Faith comes by hearing, by hearing, by hearing. So we hear the word, and I'm referring to prosperity right now. Um, so we hear the word of God, we hear it, and, and then it drops into our heart, right? And then what? And then what do we do? Do we just sit? Do we just sit around and just think about what the word says when we hear it? Do we just think? Do we meditate on it? Yeah, meditating is good. What does meditating mean? Well, it means talking to yourself. That's one of the. That's what I was studying that before. It means meditating means talking to yourself, and I kind of do that a lot. I mean, a lot of us moms do do that, okay? And like, I mean, we have to just to kind of keep our sanity. So. <laughs> You know I do that. <laughs> Paula's like looking around like I'm crazy. I mean, come on. <laughs> so what's coming out of your mouth? You know, like, uh, um, oh, yeah, we live in Bremerton. And, yeah, you know, in the last five years, the, the housing market has really went up. So, you know, you're not going to be able to, you, you know, you're not going to be able to afford a, ha a house. So don't, you know, don't move here. Or don't, you know, just keep renting or whatever. No. Not only does death come out of the mouth, but life. Everybody say life life in Jesus name. So don't don't use your mouth to repeat what the devil says. Don't use your mouth to repeat what the devil says, okay? Because you know what? We are solution givers, okay? We bring a solution to the world, okay? The Lord showed me that one time. He's like, you know, when I was uh, I can't remember exactly what I was pressing in for or wanting because I want to see I was telling Pastor Hannah like Sometimes I get kind of obsessive um, with scale and um, <laughs> when I'm trying to lose weight, and I'll get on the scale every day. And I'm like, I want to see a solution. If what I'm doing is not working, then I'm going to have to change it up, okay? So we are solution givers to the world, okay? When, when somebody at work is saying whatever, you know, we bring a solution. If they're saying doubt and unbelief, because that's what 90, uh, you know, 95% of people, I, I shouldn't say that, but, you know, there's a lot of people that are going to, that just, it, it's, 
the way that seems right to a man, right? Doubt and unbelief because we live in the world. But we live in this world and we are not of this world. Amen. So we are to bring a solution to other people's problems because we have the key. We have the word of God. Okay, and that's for every area, every single area of our life. That's why it's so good to testify. Give your testimony, okay, for what the Lord has done in your life. And don't stop. Do it every day. Say it to yourself if you have to. Talk to your cat, you know, whatever. But, <laughs> I mean, and then faith will arise, and then you won't forget because we're all human beings, and we, we forget. That's why it's so important. I mean, I can't tell you how many times that I've gotten a, a, an old journal that's been under my bed and all dusty, and I'll take it out, and I'll open it up, and it's to 10 years ago, and it's like, oh, I forgot that's what the Lord did for me. You know, it's so good. This is totally not what I was going to talk about, but <laughs> I mean, I'll receive it. So Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that Christ raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen? So, but believing and confessing does not just apply to salvation, okay? You believe God's word concerning your finances, and you confess out of your mouth whatsoever you're believing for, amen? Using God's word. Okay, this is a promise, and all of his promises are yes and amen. Because many people, you know, they'll tithe for years and years and years and, and give. And, yeah, you know, my par you know, my parents gave for 30 years. This is hypothetical. It's not like my parents. But, you know, yeah, they gave to this ministry for 30 years. And, you know, they've never, <laughs> they've never had any breakthrough um, because they'll just give. Okay, this is what we do, like as a religious duty or whatever, you know. But they are not, you know, everything boils down to what? relationship with the father right so they're getting their paycheck they're giving the 10 percent they're giving the extra 20 dollars to the guest speaker you know but they are not attaching that to something based on god's promises you have to open your mouth you have to speak it out over and over and over and over again okay i remember when um when we were in bible school here and uh, we had to memorize Matthew 11:22 22 through 25. Have faith in God, for assuredly I say unto you. And I said that I walked around my house with my babies, and I said that every single morning for like six months, okay? And I started to use that and apply it to different things in my life, and I just watched the hand of God come down and move mountains out of my life. Amen? So we have to. Open our mouth, okay? Even if we're, we're um, what is it, um, uh, introverts, we still have to open our mouths and speak it out into the atmosphere, okay? The atmosphere does change when we speak the word of God. For example, this last week, I was just sitting on my couch and... Um, I was reading out of the Passion Translation. I was just reading it, and Justice and Elijah were praying. And I think I was reading Ephesians, but Justice was like, Mommy, is, that, is what you're saying real? I said, yes, I'm reading, I'm reading the word of God. She says, Mom, Mom, I want to see Jesus right now. I want to know him right now. And it was a pure hunger. So as I was reading God's word, and it was going out into the atmosphere. It was changing the atmosphere, and it was producing hunger in a six-year-old girl. Okay? Straight up. I watched it happen out of my spirit. I watched it. I saw the hunger rise up out of justice. I saw it. And that is what we are to do when we go out, regarding finances, regarding whatever, anything in our life. Amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're quiet, you know, if you, if you don't, if, if you just choose to just, you know, not speak the word of God, it's like his hands are tied. He can't do anything. 
I mean, don't get me wrong. He's merciful and he's faithful and he is, you know, and, and he still, he'll still bless you. And, but I mean, we've been hearing over and over for months, Pastor Jason talking about the authority. There's like a theme, the authority, the authority of the spoken word of God through each one of us, right? There's so much authority in that spoken word. So, yeah, the Bible doesn't say, you know, Satan shall follow me all the days of my life. No. It says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then I have, let's see, Galatians 3.13. I didn't write it down, but I think it's the, the curse. Jesus became a curse for us, right? Does anybody know it? Galatians 3.13. I think it's Je Jesus became a curse for us. Curse of the law. Yeah. Just 13. Just 13. <laughs> but it's good. It's good. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> uh, say this. The curse is broken. The blessing is mine. Hallelujah. Huh. But it's accessed through faith in your heart, right? Through faith. Faith pleases God. And confidence, you know? And confidence. It's like, it's that confident, expectant faith. Confidence. Faith. Believing. Believing his word. Believing that he will perform it. Confidence in that. Where do we get that confidence? Do we get the confidence in just, um, like, just reading the word, like, reading the word an hour a day, check off, check, check, check? Is that where we get confidence? The only place that we're going to get confidence is in the throne room of God, <laughs> is intimacy with him, laying everything aside. So that's where everything starts. Everything leads back to that. That's where we can get confidence. Amen. So hallelujah, the curse has been broken and the blessing is mine. Hallelujah. We speak the incorruptible seeds of God's word that is unable to return void. Amen. Hallelujah. It can't. <laughs> it can't return void. It can't. Do you believe it? <laughs> hallelujah. Okay, and then I have... The last scripture is Job twenty two twenty eight, and it's you will you will declare a thing and it will be established for you. And they also put the ESV version: you will decide on a matter and it will be established for you. So let's just decide. We decide that God's word works. Let's just decide on a matter. What is it in your life that you that you want to decide that you that's going to happen? Just decide on that and speak it out. Declare it. Decree it. Amen? And it will be established before you. Amen? So I really got a revelation of that scripture uh, a couple months ago in, wait, yeah, in, in April. And I wanted to see Pablo's truck paid off, even though we've only had it for 18 months. So I took that scripture, and I started declaring, and I started decreeing that his truck is paid off in full in Jesus' name. And I didn't care what about anything else. I just, I just simply believed. I just simply believed. And I spoke it out, but I had to speak it out. I couldn't just, you know, I mean, there's not a formula, but you don't just speak it out once and then believe it's going to happen and then just like, yeah, you know. No, you speak it out with authority, you know, on a continual basis. And it's just like you talk to the Lord about it, and he talks to you, and, you know. But anyways, so... I was de decreeing that his truck would be paid off because I want to have less payments and just, you know, whatever, me and the Lord. Like, so <laughs> I am not kidding you. Like, I just made, so I made a big old payment on, I looked it up because I didn't make sense to what, what I'm about to tell you doesn't make sense. But um, April 29th, I made a big payment. Since then, I made one, two, three, like a couple of other really big payments. But anyways, last week, I paid it off. 
okay? I mean, it is not a little bit of money, okay? We've had the truck for 18 months. 18 months now. We got it in December 2018. And I'm like, what, 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 wait, what is happening? And I told Layla, too, because I had first declared it to Layla. We were hanging out, and I was like, I declare and decree that Pablo's truck is, and she can, she can, she's witness to that. So, um, I mean, it was a lot of money, and I'm like, uh, how did this happen? Like, I don't I don't even want to try to figure it out, right? We don't even need to try to figure these things out because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. That's why if you think you don't have enough in your bank account and you can't tithe or whatever, you know, it doesn't matter because it doesn't make sense. There's a heavenly realm, okay? So you ask the Lord what it is that he wants you to give. And you know what? He was, and I will also tell you, okay, not only did we pay off the truck in the last, in, within a six week time period, but we have given more to this ministry and other ministries that the Lord said to than we ever have in our life. Okay? We've given more, but yet I was still able to pay off the truck. I mean, so. As you give, and the Lord is always stretching us, right? He's always stretching us in every area of our lives, every area. In finances, too. Where's your heart? You know what I'm saying? He's going to stretch you. He's going to stretch you. He's going to stretch you. A few times the Lord gave to, was telling me, give this amount. Give this amount. And it wasn't like, you know, on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night right before the event. However, he will speak to us then. But it's a, it's a, a, a relationship, you know? It's a relationship. You know, I care about what the Lord wants me to do with our finances. So, therefore, I talk to him about it, and he shows me. And he does that for anyone who's willing. Anyone, anyone, anyone that cares about what the Father's heart is regarding their finances or anything, any area in their life, you talk to him about it, and he will answer you every single time. Amen? So I encourage you to be stretched today in your offering. You know, give the best gift you've ever given. And, you know, throughout the week, talk to the Lord about, you know, if you get, you know, large sums of money, Lord, what do you want? You know, he's placing into our hands. We're just a funnel. We're just a vessel, right? Including finances. We don't have to figure everything out. I mean, yes, we'd be responsible with our bills and you know, all that stuff. But it doesn't have to make sense. It's not going to make sense. Step into the supernatural realm with your finances. It doesn't make sense with the mind. Don't try to figure it out. Because the more you give, the more that the Father is going to be able to release into your hands. Amen? Not just finances, but favorable situations, businesses, business ideas, strategies from heaven. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So are we getting the stuff ready and passing out the envelopes? <laughs> oh, so if you're watching, <laughs> you can give online at rivernorthwest.org slash give. Okay, and make your checks out to the River Northwest Church. Okay. Hallelujah. You guys already passed them out? All right. Well, let's pray. <laughs> Father... <laughs> Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for this place where you've placed us for such a time as this, Lord God. Thank you, Father. We are privileged to sow into the kingdom, Father, into this ministry. And, Father, you are a God of multiplication. So I ask, Lord, that you multiply what comes in, Lord God, for this ministry and for each one giving, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God, for increase for each one under the sound of my voice in every realm, Lord. Because we don't want to hold anything back from you. We want to hit the mark. We know that there is not much time left, Lord. And we want to occupy until you come. And we know that it takes finances. So we put our, we trust you with our finances. And we give you our best gift today, Lord. And we say multiply it in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God. And we are excited and we are expecting you to come and move. We're expecting something awesome to happen from this seed that's being sown today. 
Hallelujah. I thank you for testimonies coming forth of increase. I thank you that your hand is upon God's people, upon us, upon your children for such a time as this. Raise us up, Lord. Raise us up, Father. I thank you for the finances for the new building, Lord God. I thank you. I thank you that it's everything that pastors Jason and Hannah has in their hearts, Lord God. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Lord God, for this. I thank you. I call it forth. I decree it, and I declare it in Jesus' name. And we are in agreement, and we're two or more coming agreement on earth concerning anything that I ask that will be done by you. And I thank you. Let your perfect will be done, Lord God. I declare that Bremerton shall be saved. I declare that Washington shall be saved. I declare that a revival to sweep through America in Jesus' name, Lord God. Give us one last great awakening before you return, Lord God, and we are excited to be a part of it. We are excited to be your end-time army. There is no doubt that we are your end-time army. Help us, Father, to live with purpose, Lord, going towards what you have called us to do, Lord God, in unity in this church and with our brothers and sisters around the world. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, we're going to be taking communion, and I'm going to share some on the body and the bread. Do we want to get the bread out? <laughs> so if uh, ushers can pass out the, the cracker, <laughs> a.k.a. the bread, <coughs> and I'll share while it's being passed out. So, so let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. You know, I've been impressed... This isn't really the subject of my of what I'm talking on here, but impressed so much how the Bible, you know, the scripture says not one jot or one tittle will pass away from the law, which equates to us, you know, not one cross T or dotted I. You know, everything that God said comes to pass. Everything is true. Everything is real. Yesterday I was uh, watching a guy on uh, YouTube <coughs> And he mentioned how uh, how it was naked at the tree in the Garden of Eden, and then it was naked on the tree at the cross. You know, I was like, what? Like, I never thought of that. You know, it was the tree that made man naked because of the transgression. And so a man who was naked had to be hung on the tree. That's why they call it a tree. It never says on wood. It says on a tree. You know, and it's always been a little strange. Well, why on a tree? Well, there was purpose. God has very specific legal purposes for everything. And this, you know, this ties into it because there's very specific legal spiritual truths in taking the articles of the communion, as we call it, which is really the articles of the covenant, you know. So I'm going to start out here in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Paul said, I have received of the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he took the bread and broke it, right? Now, a little lower there, it says, verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink the cup. So he, for he who eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation or judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So it's important that we discern the Lord's body. And uh, there's, there's a couple aspects to discerning his body that I want to focus on. The first one is hi actually his physical body. Like, what did Jesus do with his body while he was on the earth? So we run over to John 10. A little framework on it. I didn't actually write the verse. I just wrote John 10, and i got to remember exactly where the verse is. So he is the good shepherd, right? Come on, where are you? There you go. Verse 11. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. But he who is a hired hand and not the shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. So the good shepherd laid down his life, his physical body, for the sheep. 
And then over in John 12, 24, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So he knew what he was doing. He was dying as that grain going into the ground with his body, his body which he said was broken. And right here it says it falls into the ground and it dies. It breaks apart and produces a plant which produces much fruit. Well, that was obviously the fruit ends up being us, you know, those who believe. And while he was on the cross, actually going to the cross, we'll start with that part. In 1 Peter 2.24, as part of his dying, part of his breaking of his body. I mean, this is a very, very well rehearsed scripture, and it's very good. It says, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. By his wounds you were healed, or by his stripes you were healed, or the scourging. You know, the whole process of going up to the cross was a process of healing for us. He took that. He took the judgment, really, that was, if you go throughout the law, there's a lot of judgment for sin, and a lot of that involved, you know, wounds on the back, and a lot of that involved sickness. Now, just recently, I heard, this was third-hand recount of someone's vision, but, because I heard it from someone who <laughs> heard it from him, but it was Ed Dufresne. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's gone home by now, but but he had a vision when he was an usher in, uh, in his church, and he, they were doing communion, and he said, Lord, I don't even know why we do this. Like, what is this for? And he said he saw a vision of Jesus on the cross, and it was like your traditional uh, Catholic crucifix, you know, Jesus on the cross, and there were words going into him, and the words were sickness, and he could read them, you know, and he didn't say what they were saying, but, you know, it's like tuberculosis going in, and when it hit his body, his body would jolt, like being struck with those words, struck with the judgment of, of the sickness, you know. And it said it quickly became to where the words were just too fast. They were coming from all angles and just striking him and striking him from so many words of sicknesses. I mean, there's a lot of definitions of sickness, so you can only imagine. And he said before it was done, before the vision was done, he couldn't recognize Jesus. You know, it says he was marred more than any other man. He was unrecognizable because of so much sick and really it's the spiritual aspect of the sickness that makes him unrecognizable you know you can see a body people have said when you see like someone who's died they look at their body and they're like you can point out features but you don't recognize it because the spiritual aspect has changed you know and so he bore all of that judgment in our body and that is a first aspect a major aspect of judging what his body did the body of the Lord, is that he bore our sicknesses and carried away our pains. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. He bore it all. Yeah. And for us to bear it or for us to disregard that or to treat it lightly is kind of insulting. I don't, I'll, I'll say kind of because that's putting it a little too nice. You know, to treat the things of God lightly, God calls that dishonoring him. Yeah. You know, that's what the actual words say. It's a dishonor to God to treat them lightly. So we value this. We treat that as a great work that the Lord has done. And we don't insult him by trying to take on sickness for ourselves. Like we're going to help him in his work that he's already done. <laughs> now let's go over to the, another aspect, which is very important, about discerning his body. Now if you read in 1 Corinthians I'm not going to go to that part, but in 1 Corinthians 11, it also, actually back in 10, it talks about how when they came together to have their food and to eat the Lord's Supper, he says, you're not coming together to eat the Lord's Supper because some of you are drunk, you guys are butting ahead in line, getting your food first, you know, basically you're disregarding each other, you're treating each other like trash. Yeah. You know, and in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, hopefully I wrote that down right because we don't go up to 27. 12, 2? 12. Well, I probably wrote it down wrong, but your bodies. Yeah, that, that's what it says. Got to find it again. It says, if I could find my reference again, I scribbled it too fast. 1227? Oh, I'm in Romans. Romans isn't going to help me. 
<laughs> Amazing how often that happens. You think you flip somewhere. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. I'll just stop right there. So Jesus died, just like we said. He was that corn of wheat, but his body didn't stop there. You know, it says the body is sown one body and is raised another body. His body expanded when he was raised, and the body became us. Now we are his body. Yeah. You know, you abide in the Lord. Well, we l literally are the body of Christ. Yeah. He does have a physical body still, and you could touch it, and it's not like there's a little mat stuck, you know, on his shoulder, which is kind of freaky. <laughs> but literally, in the spiritual aspect, we are his body. Yeah. And Ephesians 5, and that's really, I mean, I'm going to go to Ephesians 5 because this hits me so well. Let me, let me just go to it. Ephesians 5, 29. Ha, ha. I love this scripture. It says, no one ever hated his own flesh. So this applies to Jesus. But nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord cares for the church. So he nourishes and cherishes the church, his body, yeah. right? For we are members of his body. So he nourishes and cherishes each member of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. So the Lord himself is very interested in your physical body yeah. and the corporate body. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as it being the corporate body, the other aspect of examining yourself before we take this is how do I treat my brothers and sisters? You know, this is when I look at you, we're one body. Like it's like one finger looking at the other finger. I can't look at you and think that you're any different than me. Like literally, I can't, there is no separation. We're connected entirely, you know, and I've got to look at you and say, you're part of the body of Christ. So if I treat you anything other than the way I treat Jesus, I, I can't. I, I mean, that's the wrong statement. I can't treat you any way different than I treat Jesus because how I treat you is how I am treating the Lord's body. I'm, I'm convicting myself. <laughs> Not convicting, but, you know, that's, that's strong, you know. And that's actually, I heard a minister, we'll take it after, after I say this, I heard, heard a minister say, because that's the real, the, the first commandment is love one another. It's loving, I mean, we got love the Father, love each other. But when Jesus said, I tell you, love one another as I have loved you. We do love the world. We do express the love of God to the world. But loving one another is what the Lord emphasized. Yeah. And so this minister was saying, I can't speak ill of anyone, no matter who they are, what they do, because I don't know if they're born again. And if I speak ill of them, I'm speaking ill of a member of the body of Christ. And that's a bad thing, you know. And in reality, that can place you where you receive judgment. Yeah. You know, you step yourself out of the mercy of God, out of the commandment of love, which is really the only commandment we have now. Now you're stepping yourself into a place where the judgment of God is. And we're not going there. And that's what we're doing when we take this. We receive what he broke for us. We check ourselves and say, we walk in your love, Lord. And thank God that his healing power flows, and it flows in everyone's body all the time. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Let's take it. I don't know about y'all, but I'm messed up in a really good way right now. Oh, hallelujah. Everybody say, thank you, Lord, for your body that was broken for me. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to, we're going to talk about the blood. I get the privilege of talking about the blood. So much to say about the blood. Oh, my Lord. Matthew 26, verse 27. Try to keep up with me. I got a few scriptures here we're going to go to. I'm going to try not to take too much time. Then he, Jesus, capital he, took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. All of you drink from it. See, it's the heart of God that every single one of us drink of this cup. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Amen. 
the new covenant. And I think it's important that we understand the heart of God in this, that he's sitting at the table with his disciples and even the one who was going to betray him. And he still wanted them all to drink from that cup. It was his desire that they all went into covenant, even though he knew his heart, even though he knew it was written in the scriptures. I believe if there was some way that Judas could have had turned in his heart, that the Lord would have received him and forgave him. I believe that this was a last ditch effort of mercy to try to penetrate the man who's going to betray him, betray him, his heart. The heart of God. Amen. Amazing. The mercy and love that he extends for us. For the blood is the, is the, uh, for the, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. Everybody say the new covenant. covenant. And let's look, look, look at Luke 22, verse uh, 15. Hallelujah. Thank God for technology. What did I say, 15? 16, 16. I think, no. Lord help me. 22. <laughs> hmm. Then he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired. <laughs> I think it's interesting in the Greek language, he uses the same exact word. With fervent desire, I have desired. I desire, I desire. I desire, I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you that I will no longer eat of this until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took and he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide among you. Even, yeah, you, Judas, yeah, divide this among you. For I say that I, or, for I say that I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. In verse 19, he took the bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and he gave and said to him, this is my body. Um, let's look at 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Which is shed for you. The new covenant. The new covenant. Amen. It's his desire that we all enter into this new covenant with him. Amen. That all the rights that Jesus had and has now becomes our rights. Even though we don't deserve it. Even though we couldn't earn it. Amen. Amen. It's his desire. I love how he says this up here in verse 15. Then he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. It was his heart, his plan. The whole entire purpose of his life was to bring man who was separated from God, who couldn't reach out and feel God, couldn't experience him, couldn't hear his voice, couldn't have relationship with his father. It was his purpose. It was his desire that he desired to eat this covenant meal with them, to bring us back unto the father, to come back unto the father. Whoo, hallelujah. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 <laughs> Run to the Father. Mm-hmm. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. You, pro- you proclaim the Lord's death. You proclaim the Lord's death every time you do this. Every time you partake of this, you're, you're, you're declaring, you're preaching, you're showing, you're speaking, you're teaching. Every time you're taking this time to acknowledge him and what he did, you're like, Lord, you were separate, you, the Lord's death. You're proclaiming the Lord's death. You're, you were separated in your physical body, your spirit from God, so I can no longer be separated from God and come unto you. It's by your blood, Lord Jesus. It's by your blood, Lord Jesus, that I come unto the Father in this new covenant where all things, he's given to us all things freely. He's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. It's only through his blood. It's only through his blood. Through his blood, we have this access into this new covenant. 
Through his blood, we have the remission of sins. Through his blood, we've been cleansed of all of our sins. <laughs> Through his blood, he bought us with his own blood, purchased us. He redeemed us. He paid the price that could not be paid by any other way. Your good deeds meant nothing. <laughs> Philanthropists, nothing. You can give all you have to the poor and have not nothing because of the separation from God. <laughs> he made peace with God in us through his blood. Made peace. We were enemies by our very core of our nature. It's who we were. Don't allow yourself to think any other thing. We were not the sons of God before becoming born again. And now there's one man in Christ. There's not different nations. They're not different races. They're not different colors of skin. You're either in Christ or you're not. That's it. That's all. I don't see color. I see brothers and sisters or you need to be my brother or sister. That's it. He made peace with God and us through his blood. <laughs> Redemption through his blood. He cleansed our consciences to serve the living God. His blood cleansed our conscience. We don't have to think about what we did 20 years ago, that horrendous thing that if anybody would have known, they would have out, outcasted us. We would have went to prison. We should have been. No. He's cleansed our consciences from dead works to serve the living God, to serve him with all of our hearts. He's cleansed our conscience. His blood. Everybody shout his blood. His blood has cleansed our consciences to serve the living God. He's not holding things over our head, be like, oh, you can't go that far because you still got, we, I remember that. That's not how we operate. He cannot, everybody say he cannot. He cannot operate that way. It's impossible. You know, sometimes we want to hang on to this junk. Bringing it up, God's like, what are you even talking about? You're frustrating the grace. You're frustrating the grace of God. That's not your identity in Christ. It's not who you are in him. You're forgiven. You're redeemed. You've been brought and you've been made peace with God. Ha, you've been cleansed. How many guys know what it means to be cleansed? There's not like, oh, there's still a little bit of a smell there. I couldn't get that spot out. No, 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 that spot's gone. And now your consciences have been made cl cleansed to serve the living God. And because of that, you should have boldness. Boldness to enter the holiest of holies. You have boldness by the blood of the Lamb to go into the holiest of holies. Do you know that in the Old Testament, if somebody tried to walk up into the holiest of holies, immediately, if they didn't do everything right according to the law, every single thing, they'd fall over dead. The bell would quit ringing. They'd pull them out. But because of Jesus and his blood and what he did for us to bring us into covenant with our heavenly father, we have boldness, confidence to enter into the holiest of holies, a new and living way, not attainable by the work of the flesh, not attainable <laughs> by the plan of man or the hand of man. Only by the blood. It's only by the blood. It's only by the blood. And because of that perfect blood, that spotless lamb, with, oh, because of that, we have boldness to enter in the holiest of holies. And now that you're in the holiest of holies, face to face with your heavenly father, because Jesus said no man comes to the father unless he comes through me. How many of you guys know Jesus is the doorway? All things have to come through Jesus. Everything we do, everything we say, everything that we live needs to come through Jesus. It has to. Otherwise, it's the work of the flesh. Jesus says you go up another way, you're a thief or a robber. You're trying to climb up some other way. Let your life go through him, through his blood, through his life. Ha, ha, ha. And once you have this boldness to come into the holiest of holies, 
you don't have to leave. You never have to leave the holiest of holies. It wasn't like in the Old Testament where they did their job and like, whoo, I got to get out of here, man. That was, whew. man, you know, if I, if I was that close, I think I almost missed it and I would have fell over dead. They were probably pretty quick to get up out of there in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament where, where you, your conscience has been cleansed, you've been made peace with God through the blood of the Lamb, and you have this boldness to enter in. You have boldness to enter into the holiest of holies. You don't ever have to leave. This is where we belong. This is what Jesus provided with his blood was us to have the access to go into this place because there's nothing else that's going to make a difference in our life. Your positive outlook, you, you know, you chanting things of, 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 of positivity is not going to help you. You have to have a nature change. You have to have a face-to-face -face encounter with an almighty God. And when your heart becomes changed, your life reflects that change. And when you stay in this place, just you and him face-to-face, -face, you don't want to leave. It's like Moses in the, Old, in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 33 where he would go into the temple and Joshua would come right behind him. And Moses had to go out and take care of some business. And Joshua was like, I'm staying right here, Jack. This is my spot. Yeah, you can't get me up out of here. Now, is it coincidence that he was he led the he led the march after all the old fogies died who wanted to be stiff necked and hard headed? After they finally died, they're like, God, man, thank God they're finally like, we can, we can go now. Let's go. We got this. Is that coincidence? He found where he belonged. He found the source of power. And it's not in in, in fifteen point sermons. It's not in wearing a path in your carpet, saying the same thing over and over and chanting in tongues until you sore jaw and dry mouth. You know, I'm not saying don't pray, pray in tongues. I'm not saying not speak the word. But if it, if it isn't attached to that relationship like Kristen was talking about, that faith works by love. If it's not coming from that place, it's dry. It's religion. And God will have mercy on you because he loves you. And he'll continue to extend that mercy to you. But you have to see this thing more clearly. You have to see it in a more healthy perspective. It's where you belong in his presence. You are a son. You are a daughter of the living king, of the living God. And that's where you belong. Don't let anything else come forth from your life other than that place of sonship, other than that place of daughtership. Amen. It's the blood. It's the blood. It's the blood. And right now, I just want us all to take this time and just... Remember him. Let us proclaim his death. Let us take this cup and lift it up and just thank him for all that he provided, for bringing us unto the Father. <sighs> thank you, Lord, that we couldn't help ourselves, but you demonstrated your love for us when we were still yet sinners. God, we acknowledge, we proclaim, and we preach your death. Your life that you've given to us, this new covenant through your blood, Lord. Hallelujah. And just like you instructed your disciples that we all partake of this, Lord, we, we thank you for it. And we take up this cup and drink. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. All righty. So I'm just going to encourage you guys with something that I was able to be able to talk with my mom yesterday, which is I'm really blessed to have my parents and be able to have really deep and intimate conversations with them about anything, usually the things of God. Um, but, you know, we were just talking about, uh, you know, life and success and the call of God on each individual's life, you know, and I was kind of talking to her about a man that I really, you know, 
am kind of fascinated with is creativity and uh, how that has to come from God. You know, our creator gave us our skills and our talents and those things that have been given to us to bring him glory, you know. Um, and each person has been given, you know, the Holy Spirit. Each person has been given the word of God, but we've also been given individual things to each one of us. And I kind of just brought up uh, the parable of the talents so in Matthew 25, and verse, starting in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, e to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. And the emphasis that I was kind of bringing with my mom is that he left. He gave us our talents, but then he left. He went on his journey. So now God will never leave you nor forsake you, but at the same time, he can't, he can tell you what you need to do, but he can't, like, guide you all the way. He can't push you and make you do it. You have to follow the word of God, and you have to act. In Proverbs, it says that a fool looks outside and sees that there's a lion, so stays inside, and laziness overtakes him. Fear and laziness go right along, and many people, many people will say, well, I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord to step out into what he has. Because each person here has dreams. Each person here, young and old, has dreams, goals. They have family members that they're believing to get, be saved. They have all sorts of things that God has given to you. And if you have dreams and goals, then you are called. If you have dreams and goals, then you are chosen to fulfill those dreams and goals. Because that all comes from the Father. Now, when we're... <laughs> When we are called to do the Father's work, it's up to us to carry that out. It's up to us to use our talents to carry those out. See, now, we know the rest. I'm kind of going to recap, but more. The one with five produced another five. The one with two produced another two. Now, the one dug it in the ground and buried it because of fear. Fear overtook him. And <laughs> along with laziness, yeah. the fear and laziness go along. Yeah. So it's our job to step out and carry out the things that God has for us. Amen. And then we also have everything we need to succeed as well. The talents that he gave you is what you need yeah. to carry those things out. Yeah. You know, he has given each person, uh, and it says right here again, each person according to his own ability. It's you have the ability to fulfill your dreams. You have the ability to fulfill what you have been called to do. That's what Jesus, it's a blessing that he's given to us. But it is, it's, it's disrespectful not to carry those out. And that's what Jesus, that's what Jesus says. In this letter half, he's coming down very, very strongly. If we jump down over to verse 24, then he who had received the one talent came to him and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not uh, scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, here, you can have what's yours. God has called each one of us to fulfill a purpose. And when we come back to him empty handed and like, well, I just... I waited on the Lord, and I just, I wasn't feeling anything, so I just, I just kind of went along, and now that person I was believing for is passed on, and I don't know where they went. This is a big deal. This is life or death situations. The dreams that he has given to each one of us is life or death situations for people who we don't know yet. And when we come to the Lord saying, well, I was, I was waiting on you to reveal to me what you had. He gave you the dream. He gave you the talents. It's time for us to step out and go. It's time for us to step out and walk the walk that he has for us. And it says in verse 26, But the Lord answered to him and said, You wicked and lazy servant. So there again, fear is along with laziness. Okay, They both feed off of each other. 
The Lord answered to him and said, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. The, he could have done the least of at least putting that money somewhere with someone else so that they could do the work with it. You know, and it just like the Lord said, if we don't, you know, give praise, the rocks will cry out. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to the man who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Now, a lot of us, our dreams are responsibilities, you know, for a person who has a dream to go out and throw mass crusades, okay? They have that dream. Now, God has called them. He's given them the gift of speaking. But they are sitting down in their house and like, Lord, nobody is, nobody is calling me to go minister at their church. Well, you don't step outside your door and minister to your neighbor. <laughs> There's a whole world out there that we could be walking and doing. But instead... What we have gets taken away from us because we are not faithful with that little. It's one step at a time. And God lays it out for us in his word. We don't have any excuse. And he gave us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the Holy Spirit and the word. That's all we need. And he even gave us the talents. We don't even need the talents. We don't need the talents. If we had no talents but we still had the word of God and the Holy Spirit, we could fulfill it. But God is such an amazing creator that he created each one of us to have specific talents and gifts that we can carry it out. So as a body, we can all together walk. If I didn't have my knee, I wouldn't be able to walk. If I didn't have the leg bone here, I wouldn't be able to walk. Each individual thing, has, person has their own calling to fulfill. And that's all that I have to share, really. Simple as that, <laughs> you know. We do have such great talks and conversations, and it's so important to just have those talks with your kids and be honest and open with them and talk about the things of God and dreams and visions and help them to have understanding about, you know, life on earth and what we are doing here, why we're here, you know. Um, and I know sometimes it seems like you're talking to a brick wall, <laughs> and but you're not. You know, this, the word will not return unto us void, and it's seed time and harvest, and we just keep on sowing into our children. They're our first ministry, and we sow into them, and really with them, it's not necessarily preaching. It's through conversation. We have conversations. I mean, as they're older, when they're young, we whoop their butts. <laughs> we tell them, no, that's hot, don't touch. And then, you know, and then, and then we develop, and we, and, and, okay, let me say that, because I'm nice too, and, and we hold them, and we love them, and we nurture them, and then we begin to be, they mature, and we develop a mature relationship with them, where we can actually talk to them more from our heart, and the things that are important, and to give them a leg up for the future, like Jason, remember how he had the, how he had JJ on his shoulders, you know, like our ceiling is their floor, we should pray that our ceiling becomes the floor of our children, and we should pray that, that, they, that we work for them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I don't know how that would work for all of us. We'll figure it all out. But I, I told Zeke, I'm like, you go, and you go, you go have businesses and churches and youth centers. And go do it. Go do it all. Go fulfill. You know, we'll either work for you or fund you until you fund us or, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, but it is, you know, your... I wanted him to share that because it goes with what I, with what I, uh, what I have, and I don't have a very long message either. But endurance to be a lifelong disciple of Jesus Christ, and how you know when we sign up for this, uh, we say yes to the Lord, and we don't know everything that's ahead of us. We don't know exactly where our life is going to go. Uh, we do uh, begin to understand with maturity that there are things that we speak to and that we decree and that we change. And there are other things that happen to us that could be caught uh, surprises and um, traumas and situations that we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And none of it, neither of us are exempt from any of that. We live on this fallen planet. And um, 
when we say yes to Jesus, we say yes to him being our Lord and Savior at all costs. It doesn't matter. And we want to be sure that when we're presenting the gospel, that we don't just say, it's free, it's free, it's free. Here, just have it. It's just like any other God. It's like any other thing. It's just another religion. It's not. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And it's not like, I'm going to try this religion, just like I'm going to try Buddhism, and then I want to try this, and then I want to try that. This isn't even in the same category. There's all the religions of the world, and then there's the way, the truth, and the life. And when you find the way, the truth, the life, you are done seeking and you're done searching. Now, it's everything that Zeke said, now you're, you become born again, and you're on the path. And you're on this lifelong journey of discipleship. So when we signed up, we signed up from start to finish. And it's not how you start. How clean do you have to be to get into a bathtub? You, it's not how you start. You get in the bathtub. You let Jesus clean you up. You let him create in you a new heart, a new life. So it's not how you start, but it is how you finish. And it is important. So what he's saying is it's important that we continue to allow the Lord to strengthen us in our life and our walk with him and that we stay strong to the end. And I think there's this, some faulty thinking um, that, uh, that you just get older and you just kind of wither and then, and then go to be with Jesus. And if your dreams didn't happen when you were young, then oh well. And that's not true. I mean, let's really look at people like T.L. Osborne and like Kenneth Hagin and these men and Smith Wigglesworth that have gone before us, and I know there's women too, that have fought all the way to the end and finished their course all the way. And all of the apostles that we read about, they fulfilled everything all the way to the end. They were all killed. They were all killed for their faith. Every single one of the, 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 tw the 12. Well, I mean, Judas died in a different way. But um, <laughs> but we want to have the mindset and the mentality that I am going to be on fire for Jesus until the day that I slip out of this body and I see him face to face. I'm not going to lose my passion. I'm not going to lose, you know, the talents that he's given me. I'm not going to say I'm too old. It's too late. Too much time is wasted. I've been too hurt. I've been too beat up. We are not ever going to have that mentality. I know that surprises come in life and things come that hinder us and that hurt us and stab us and wound us. I understand that. But we can rise up as more than conquerors. And I'm going to talk about being more than a conqueror. But do you know what more than a conqueror is? It's when you're married to a boxer and he's big and he's buff and he is the, the champion and he is the conqueror of all conquerors. And he gets in there and he puts up a good fight and he fights all the way to the end and he kicks butt and takes names and he gets the $2 million check and he's the conqueror. And that's Jesus. He is the conqueror of all conquerors. But you know what? You're more than a conqueror because that boxer goes home to his wife and he says, here, here you go. Here's the two million or whatever. You're more than a conqueror. And that's who we are. We're more than conquerors. Jesus has won the ultimate victory. He has won it all. And he gives us the check. He gives us the victory. Thank you, Lord. He makes us more than conquerors. So you are apt and able to run your race to the finish. So we're going to neglect and rebuke and get rid of all thinking that would say, I'm going to fizzle out and I'm just not like, oh, it's just all coming to an end for me because I'm turning this age or whatever. That is a lie and that is a farce. And we are getting rid of that. A lifetime is not too long to live on fire and passionate for God. And maybe you dropped 10 years. Maybe you lost 10 years. But isn't he the restorer? Doesn't he promise that he's the one who will restore the years that the locust has eaten? Isn't it him that says that he'll do that? So say we've made mistakes and say that we've messed up or say that something came and stabbed us and, or we feel like not took the legs out from underneath us. It's not too late and it doesn't matter. Get back on. I look at grace like this. You know when you're at the airport and there's that cool walking thing and there's just this, I call that grace. Because you, you're in your lane, and you get on, and you know, you're still walking. Just like Zeke said, I am still walking. I'm still doing my part. I'm still, but you know, there's something that's making me go, f and I'm like, <laughs> feeling good, going fast, high five. I call that grace. There's the 
this ability where you're still working, you're still moving, you're still going somewhere, but there's strength. There's something under you pushing you. And you know what? Sometimes somebody might come along and push you off the thing, or you might get yourself all fumbled up and fall off. Okay, well, get back on. And find some friends in your life that are going to pull you out of a pit and put you back on that pace of grace. We need people around us that will help us. There is a place of grace for you. And like he said, it's all been given to us. Jesus said, I give you the talents. It's not like, oh, you're going to have to go find them. (laughs) I'm teasing you. Let's play hide and seek. Maybe by the time you're 80, you'll find them. Then you're going to have to believe me for the strength to. No. He says, you born again here. This is what you're called to do. Here's the strength to do it. Now, it still takes faith. We don't see the whole picture. And sometimes side swipes come, and we're like, uh, do I even see the path? Like, <laughs> everything I saw is gone. He still has a plan. He still has a vision. He still knows where you're going. You might not know, currently know where you're going, but he still knows where you're going. Just get on the pace of grace. Get on the path. Come on, he'll take you. He'll take you there. And a lifetime is not too long to live on fire for God. We're not running aimlessly. We're not beating against the air. So we have a plumb line. You know, the plumb line is like a big rock at the bottom of a kind of string, I guess. And so it's, it's, um, it's laid down so that a building is, is straight, so that we're not the leaning tower of pizza. So the Lord doesn't want us to lean. The Lord doesn't want us to be some messed up tower that's going to fall over in the end and just, you know, that little bit off and then it just goes off and off and off. We have a plumb line, and that plumb line is the word of God. We have a plumb line for our life. It's Jesus, knowing him, living in a relationship with him, staying plugged into the word every single day of our life. The, the, the secret of our success is in our daily and our weekly routine, spending time with the Lord daily, weekly, not missing church, being involved. That's the secret to our success, praying, having our own it's not just church, but it's also having our own personal relationship with God daily. Just like the power of a toothbrush is not going to work <laughs> unless you work it daily. I have times when I'm laying in bed and the Holy Spirit's like, go brush your teeth. And I'm like, I don't want to go brush my teeth. Go brush your teeth. So it's actually scientific that if you brush your teeth, you sleep better. And it's also true that if you forgive, you sleep better. And if you let Jesus touch you, you sleep better. (laughs) So we want to have good, we want to be rested up, and we want to have strength for the long haul. I'm talking about living your life to the end. It's not how you start. How clean do you have to be to be in a bath to get into a bathtub? It's not how you start, but it is how you finish. We are we become accountable. Once we know, we become accountable. Amen. And you can overcome every single obstacle. And how many people do we have ahead of us? How many people? Let's go to Romans 12, 1. In the TPT, Sky. We have a cloud of witnesses. Not only that, we have men and women of God that are alive today that we can still look up to. They're in their, what, Kenneth Copeland? What? How old is he? 80? Kenneth Copeland? I just saw him preach on Friday. I I was like, it's Kenneth Copeland, it's Kenneth Copeland, it's Kenneth Copeland. I know it's Kenneth Copeland. I thought it was him or Paula White. And it was, sure enough, it was Kenneth Copeland at the stand. So, so Pastor Jason and Draper and the girls that went, they got to see Kenneth Copeland. He's 80-something. 83, 80, oh, come on. It's Marilyn Hickey. Thank you. I was looking for a woman, a woman. No. I don't think, 80s maybe, Marilyn Hickey. So, so we have this cloud of, of witnesses Oh, I meant Hebrews. I meant Hebrews. I'm sorry. I was stuck in Romans 12 for a long time, but I meant Hebrews. Sorry, Skylar. Uh, Hebrews 12:1 in the TPT. As for us, we have all of these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon, marathon, Life's marathon race with passion and determination for the path has already been marked out before us. And we're hearing words that have come out in the service. I, I was hearing, you know, little smidges of this through from the time prayer. So we've been on fire. We've been going since 9. I got here at about 9.15, 9.20. We've got almost 1 o'clock. We're still going. I mean, come on. When God's moving, yeah, we're swirling in the river. We're just like... 
And you hear these little smidges of, okay, this is a theme. Okay, this is the Lord speaking out of the mouth of two or, f- two or more witnesses. Let every word be established. So he's speaking to us to let go of every weight and the, everything that hinders us so that we can run life's what? Marathon. It's not a sprint. We're not in a sprint. It's not like, yeah, I'm going to get in here and I'm going to try to just do everything really quick as fast as I can with all my own strength. And it's like the, the, tor- the tortoise and the hare, you know? And then we, pfft, we fizzle out after 15 years. No, it's life's marathon race. We are in this from start until finish. Our finish line is the face of Jesus. Our finish line is Jesus telling you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of love. That is our finish line. Until we're there, we're not done. Until you are seeing Jesus' face, you're not done yet. Hallelujah. There's more work. There's more that God has for you. His gifts and calling are without repentance. He's not sorry. He's not sorry that he called you, and he's not sorry that he gifted you. He's not apologizing, and he never will. So we got to get in that pace of grace. We got to get back up on that terminal thing. What is it even called? Like, it's not an escalator. A moving walkway. I thought there was some, yeah. A moving walkway. <laughs> what, a what, a what? <laughs> Conveyor belt for people. <laughs> but I always watch my toes at the end of my shoelaces, and I'm always like, <sighs> I tell JJ, don't, just jump, jump over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 1 Peter 1, 23 and 25, through 25. Um, for, for through the eternal and living word of God, you have been born again. And this seed that he planted within you can never be destroyed, but will live and grow inside of you, what? Forever. So there's an eternal seed that was planted in you when you were born again. It's eternal. It won't die. It will not die. The only thing that you can do is say, I don't want you. I'm done with you. And I am verbally saying, get out of my life, Jesus. Other than that, this seed in you is going to keep on producing and keep on convicting and keep on going. He's going he's gonna to keep on reaching you. There are people right now that have been backslidden for 25 years, and this eternal seed is still at work within them. It's still calling their name. They might act like in pride that they don't hear God anymore, and they don't, but that's a lie. The eternal seed is inside of them. So don't, don't trust me. Everybody that's backslidden, they still hear the voice of the Lord. God is still speaking to them. They're just being prideful and saying, well, I don't know. One of these days, honey, one of these days you're going to surrender and let go because you know what? It's really hard to fight God, and you're going to lose. He's stronger, he's better, and he is the winner, and we want him to win. <laughs> so we pray for those that are backslidden. This is eternal. Human beings are frail frail and temporary like grass and the glory of man fleeting like blossoms of the field and the grass dries and withers and the flowers fall off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was announced to you. The word of the Lord. You know, people call this an outdated book. This book is going to outdate you. This book is going to outdate every king in every kingdom, every country, every culture, every every, um, song that is ever sung. Every store that ever opens, every car that's ever built, this word will endure. This is not an outdated book. The word of the Lord will endure forever. And this is the word that was preached to us, and this is the word that we're born of. So we're in him, we're going to endure forever. You're going to endure. You're going to run your race to the finish. You're not going to fall short of the finish line. Not one person under the sound of my voice is going to fall short of the finish line and the goal of seeing Jesus face to face and completing your task and your mission while you're here on this earth. Can you hand me that paper bag? It's my bag of tricks. Just kidding. So here's the... So the white cord, I got this from Francis Chan. The white cord is eternity, which is longer because there's no measuring eternity. So it's just an, just an analogy. So this little silver tip, that's, it's actually smaller than this, but that's your life on earth. Okay, this is our life on earth, right here, this little silver. And God's given us gifts and talents and abilities, and he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He gave us the eternal word of God. He saved us. He filled us with his Holy Spirit. He baptized us with the Holy Ghost and fire. And he gave us each and every single one of us, even down to our children, a mission. Nobody here is a mistake. Nobody here is an accident. Not one of you here, not one of you under the sound of my voice is an accident. Nobody's a mistake. There's no living mistake. There's no human being that was a mistake. There's not one if Jesus offered Judas one last chance, said, Bro, come on, come on. He was pleading because God, God would have found another way for him to go to the cross. He gave his life. Judas, Judas didn't take it. There's no mistakes and there's no accidents. 
but this is our life, okay? So we have this much time. So Lord, help us to, te- you know, teach us wisdom. Teach us to number our days and to do well and to do wise. Amen? Amen. 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 We can rest here. We can rest when we're in heaven, but God gives us rest when we're on earth. But some people are so obsessed with rest. It's like, okay, cool, okay, cool, go ahead. You get your rest. I'm going to run with the fire of God. I'm going to run with the fire on my life and fulfill the calling, and he'll give me rest. I don't need, when you're on fire and when you're passionate, you don't need a lot of rest. Think about Russell Wilson. What's his quote? No time for sleep. Why? Because he's passionate. When you have passion, you don't need to be like, oh, I just need rest, I just, I just need to be coddled. I just, I just. Yes, we go through times of grief, and yes, we do, okay? I am not saying and ne- negating that. There's a time and a season for everything under heaven, and there's a time to get back in the pace of grace and keep on running your race. Yeah. Hallelujah. So we signed up to be a lifelong disciple. So when you get somebody saved now, remember to tell them you're a lifelong disciple. This is a lifelong relationship. This isn't like here today and gone tomorrow. Well, that didn't really work. I didn't really hear the voice of God. I, I didn't really understand how they worshiped, so I couldn't fit in. It's not like that. You are born into the family of God. It's forever. It's forever. You're locked in, but it's not a ball and chain. It's not bondage. It's not bad. This is the relationship of all relationships. This is the life of all lives. This is the mission of all missions. Amen? This is it. We can watch Mission Impossible and think they're really cool movies, but our mission is even greater. We have an even greater mission. So that heavenly perspective, what's your 100-year plan? Most of the people here in 100 years, we won't be on this earth. Most of us. There's still some. I mean, and you know, I'm just saying. So what's our 100-year plan? So we need to have an eternal perspective. Now, I'm not saying that we... We still need to be blessed. We still need to go out and occupy until he comes. And we need to reap the harvest of the end time finances to be able to get souls saved. And it's okay for father to bless you. It's okay. It's all right because he loves his children and he will pour out his blessing. But what's not okay is that we become attached to this earth and attached to these things that when God says, oh, okay, the fire is coming. Those things are leaving. (gasps) attached <laughs> just be sure that you detach yourself when 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 everything broke out and there was you know all of us had that uncertainty and of course the first thing that we all think of is Jesus is coming back I was really disappointed when the prophets started saying no this is not the return of the Lord there's still more work to be done I was like I want Jesus to come back <laughs> I really do I really my I've told my children my husband I want Jesus to come back I love you guys I love our church I I love people, and I love my mission, but what I really want is to be with Jesus forever. That's what I really want, and that should be the desire of our hearts. And then with that, to fulfill his purpose and his plan, which is eternal. The only thing that we can take with us is souls. So whatever we're doing is occupying and setting up to bring souls into the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Now, obviously, you don't work, you don't eat. So, And you can't just sit around and be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go win souls one day, you know. Hey, everybody, will you support me? I'm a missionary, even though I don't do anything. No, we need to work. You don't work, you don't eat. The the, the hand, the diligent hand will prosper. So we do, you know, we work, we occupy. Hallelujah. So um, Saul, who who, who had a passionate distaste for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, had an encounter on the road to Damascus and turned into Paul. And in Acts 20, 24, in the New King James or the King James, or whatever you have. Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So nothing moves us, okay? We live in this world and we walk in this earth, but nothing moves us, only that I may finish my marathon race with the Lord. That is the motive of our heart, and that's our 100-year plan, okay? So our, Paul said, that's, that's my 100-year plan, and pretty soon thereafter, he got to see, you know, the salvation, that, that, that final, his faith became sight. Hallelujah. There's nothing worth hanging on to. So our, dis- our, our family is our number one disciples. You know, there is order. There is, you know, um, 
we don't want to just think that God is just calling us out into the world, the world, you know, and everything, but our home, our home is number one. He says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, into the uttermost parts of the earth. There is divine order. You know, uh, my, my children have been my first ministry, and it pays off. It pays off in the end. I know it seems kind of like, oh, man, but it's worth it. It's worth sowing into your kids. You know, moms, sow the word into your kids during the day. Dads, sow the word into your kids. Dads, put your kids to bed and read the word to them. Sow the kids in, so that they're getting it in the morning from mom. They're getting it in the evening from dad. You know what I'm saying? That is such an important ministry that we have because then we're passing that baton on to the next generation. 2 Timothy 4, 7, and I actually don't have that much. I'm, I'm almost finished. 2 Timothy 4, 7. I know we've had so much word come forth today. It's good. You guys got a good meal. You can't say that you came to the River Northwest and didn't get a good meal. You got a good, happy meal today. All right, 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So there's a good fight to fight. There's a race to win, and there's a faith to be kept. All right, so we got to do that. We got to fight the good fight. And that, that word good, it means noble, beautiful, precious. There's a precious fight. Some people have the wrong perspective. We look at the fight, man, I'm just in this fight, and it sucks. And when is this going to end? And I can't, no. Start saying, like Kristen, start saying, this is a good fight. You know what? This is a good fight. You know what? Because my life belongs to Jesus. You know what? Because I'm a more than a conqueror. Because no weapon formed against me shall prosper. This is a good fight. You want to know why? Because you win. You win. Ha ha, I win. No matter how much this battle rages, no matter what's going on, I'm fighting the good fight because I win. I am more than a conqueror. So start looking at your fight in a different perspective. Paul didn't be like, man, I fought that crappy fight. I just, want to, I just want this life to be over. I just want to go be with Jesus. He said, I fought a good fight. He was noble. He was steadfast. He endured. Amen? So fight the good fight. Hallelujah. Valiant. <laughs> More than a conqueror. Now you also have a race to win from start to finish. Let me go into my other journal really quick because I was doing notes for a couple days. All right, you've got a race to run. Your race is not against anybody. That's the awesome thing about the kingdom. You're not racing anybody. It's not me against you or you against so-and-so or you against this person. You're not against anybody. You're not in competition with anybody. Progress starts from your starting point, okay? And it's your progress. It's not somebody else's. I have a good friend, and she can run seven miles and keep a pace. And I, with all of my heart, I would so love to do that. And I've tried, and I just like... I can't do that. <laughs> but I can, t I can walk like four or five miles and just really, and I can jog a little bit really fast. I'm a fast walker. So, but we each have that like God given. Now you can work your way up. If you're, if God has placed within you this passion and you're driven and stuff, you can reach higher and higher. You follow people as they follow Christ. But your race is your race. You know, and it's good to be around pastors and leaders and people that will keep you accountable and help you if you if you have questions or you know what I'm saying, so that you can get just kind of narrow in. But why do you think the New Testament is so full of ridding ourselves from competition, envy, jealousy? I mean, he, it's it's like in almost every New Testament book. Like, don't have any of those things because you're not running their race and they're not running your race. You're running your race from start to finish. Also, there's no boasting. It's a race of the spirit. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In Jeremiah 9, you don't have to go there, 23, 24, he says, Let not the strong man boast in their strength. Let not anybody boast in who, how good they are and what a great job they can do. If anybody's going to boast, let them boast in the Lord. Let them boast in how good he's been in their life and what he has done. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by his spirit. It's a spiritual race that we're running, and it's your race. Hallelujah. So be sure to surround yourself with people. You know, you're in a marathon, and marathons are usually done together. And maybe you'll go out on a little lonesome time with the Lord, but you've got to be around people. You know, you, I, you run better, you do better, like, when you're with people. Even though you're not in competition, you help one another. Iron sharpens iron. Hallelujah. There is a faith to be kept. What pleases God? Faith. What do you need to be born again? Faith and confession. Hallelujah. 
So he says, I have kept the faith. Faith is believing in response to divine persuasion. So God divinely persuades us, and our faith responds. Our faith says, you have persuaded me of who you are and what you're going to do, and I'm responding, and I am going to live a life of faith. I have kept the faith. Where does faith begin? It begins where the will of God is known. So where is that? In the word. This is where faith begins. It's the word of faith which was preached to you. How does faith come? It comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hallelujah. How does faith operate? It speaks. When is faith? It's now. What is faith? It's the substance of the things you're hoping for, and it's the evidence of the things that you don't see. We will see him face to face. We will. For now, we keep the faith. We keep winning souls because that's the only thing that we can bring with us to heaven. Nothing else. Everything else, it's cool. Yeah, it's great. Tools are good. It's good to, ha- you know. Hallelujah. Got one more scripture and then just a couple of things. And then, what do I have in here? Okay. Isaiah 40, 21. 31. Isaiah 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth. When he will also blow on them, and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall be my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number, who calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, never faints or is weary. Never. He keeps going and going and going, and he never stops. Nothing. He just, he doesn't give up. He's not tired. He keeps going. His understanding is unsearchable. He's the one who gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he's the one who increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary. So there's nobody that can keep up with God, right? There's nobody. But The young men shall utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So the Lord is the one who gives us strength. The Lord is the one who gives us the ability to run this race to the finish. So if you're tired and you're weary, the Lord's not. Always remember that. He never sleeps. He's never, you know, bored. He's always moving. He's always working. You can always draw on his strength. We're going to live a lifetime. That whole little silver piece, we're going to live this whole span of our life here on earth. We're going to live it full of passion, zeal, fire, power, love, kindness, the fruit of the Spirit, and the life of God in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this awesome day and thank you for everything that you've done and how you've moved in our hearts and given us such a good meal and so much to meditate on and chew on and and to do, to go forth and to do and to operate. Thank you, Lord, that each one, under the sound of my voice, will fulfill the great call and the great mission and the great plan from start all the way to the finish line. Every one of us will cross that finish line and we will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. We love you, Father, and we worship you, and I bless everybody this day and this week. In Jesus' name, amen.